For our second video, we want to talk about the radial carpal joint. Now, in order to do this, it's helpful to identify a few borders that will assist us in ensuring we are distal enough on the wrist and hand. I'm going to use a dry erase marker that easily comes off just to make note of a couple uh, joint prominent areas. First, we have the ulnar styloid process over here, which lets us know that this is our distal ulna. If we follow that around, we can identify our radial styloid process here. And this lets us know that this is our distal radial ulnar joint. So when we begin to now identify our carpals, we know that we need to be distal from here. Now, arguably one of the biggest challenges to students and to individuals that are learning these techniques is ensuring that they're on what they think they're on. And the best way to do this is to understand your anatomy. So first and foremost, if we take the wrist and hand through a bit of flexion and extension, there's a couple things that we can identify. In a more resting position, the lunate moves away from us. If we come into more of a flex position, the lunate comes into my thumb right here in the middle of the wrist. Additionally, if I come more to the lateral aspect or radial aspect of the wrist, right off of the radial styloid process is where I find my anatomical snuff box. If we have the individual extend uh, an abduct here, we can see our two tendons of our anatomical snuff box. We know the base or the floor of that anatomical snuff box is our scaphoid so our patient can relax. We can palpate that scaphoid and we can put an S for scaphoid. If we move now to the medial aspect, again earlier going into more of a flex position, we know that this is our lunate, lies in our proximal row, so it's going to be found right at our radiocarpal joint. And then if we go more to the medial aspect towards the ulna, this is where we're going to find our triquetrum. If we move to then the distal row, a couple things we want to be aware of. Uh, first and foremost, uh, associated with the scaphoid and then um, uh, also our uh, second ray, we have the trapezium. And then if we come off of our metacarpal, we have the trapezoid. Moving to our third metacarpal, we have our capitate. And then finally with our fourth and fifth, we have our hamate. And so by taking just a little bit of time to identify those carpals, it will help us in terms of understanding our radiocarpal joint, that being the interplay between the distal radius and the proximal row of carpals, and then our distal row of carpals moving into our metacarpophalangeal joints. So let's start first with the radiocarpal joint. A couple things we need to be aware of. First and foremost, the radiocarpal joint contributes about 35 degrees to flexion with the rest of it coming from the midcarpal joint, that being the difference between the proximal and distal row. Approximately 45 degrees uh, is contributed to extension, again with the rest coming from the midcarpal. There's a couple different mobilization techniques and assessment techniques then that we want to look at at the radiocarpal joint and into then the midcarpal joint. First is distraction. Now with distraction, what we need to do is stabilize the radius and the ulna. And so kind of this lumbrical grip is a nice way to come around and stabilize at the distal radiocarpal, or excuse me, distal radial ulnar joint. At this point then, we want to come right at that proximal row, take hold of the proximal row, and create an opposing force. that would be distraction. Additionally, we also want to look at both a radial glide and an ulnar glide. Now radial glide, we're gliding towards the radius. That's going to increase the space, thereby helping with ulnar deviation. With an ulnar glide moving more medial on the wrist, we're improving some of the mobility on the more lateral side, thereby helping with radial deviation. So again, we want to stabilize our distal radial ulnar joint. From here, 
we're still going to be focused on this proximal row. And we'll begin with an ulnar glide. So the force is going this direction. And then a radial glide. Now the radial glide can either be done with an opposing force at the proximal or can be done with mobilizing here by stabilizing that proximal row. Finally, the last two that we want to look at are our dorsal and ventral glides. Now the dorsal glide is going to help with wrist flexion and can also be done at the mid-carpal joint. The ventral glide will help with wrist extension, again, can be done at the mid-carpal joint as well. For our dorsal glide, if we come into just a little bit of flexion that will help here, the idea is that we want to glide from the ventral aspect to the dorsal aspect. We can do it as a whole section, that being the entire proximal row, it would look like this. Or we can also come in and work on every single one of that proximal row carpals. For that, we would want to identify where the scaphoid is, stabilize the lunate, and provide a ventral to dorsal glide. Stabilize the triquetrum, find the lunate, and provide a ventral to dorsal glide. That can be done for any of the carpals by stabilizing the structure next to it and then focusing the mobilization technique here. Now keep in mind, one of the things we are doing when going ventral to dorsal is we are having to go through our carpal tunnel, so we likely lose some specificity with our palpation. With a ventral um, uh, glide, that being uh, ventral to dorsal to improve wrist uh, extension, uh, that is going to look like this. So again, we're looking to improve wrist extension. So our force is going to be moving towards the palmar aspect, dorsal to ventral. Again, we can do it holistically all across that proximal row, or we can focus one carpal onto the next. So it would look like this. Stabilize distal radial ulnar. And then move dorsal to ventral. Now you notice there's a little bit of a scooping motion with this. It's not straight linear but kind of rectilinear and that is because our distal radius is more concave whereas our carpals, specifically the lunate and scaphoid, are more convex. So again you can work on the entire proximal row, you can work on one carpal unto the next, stabilizing proximally, mobilizing distally. This is for the radiocarpal joint. Have a go with a peer or colleague. Let me know if there's any questions.